Well, we're so glad you're here today. For those of you that are maybe are new, I'm Pastor Norm. I'm the lead pastor here at Real Church. And uh, I just want to give you a quick introduction of, of who I am and what this church is about. Uh, if you, this is your first time, uh, I, I pray that today is a blessing and encouragement to you. It may be a little different. We understand our church is a, a certain flavor. You know, every church is like, it's like going to Baskin Robbins. You can have, you know, and we may be like Superman or Tutti Frutti. You may think it's Tutti Frutti, but that's okay. We're, we're, we're very, <laughs> but you know what? God uses every one of our flavors to make a difference in people's lives. Amen. Amen. So we're, we're glad you're here. But I wanted to tell you what Real Church is all about. We planted Real Church se- a little over seven years ago. And it's, it's not because we think we're real and everybody else is fake. You know, we got, we got some comments about our name. But uh, it's, it's all because, uh, you know, we want you to come to Real Church and you can be authentic. You can just be real. You don't have to pretend and put on your happy face. When you come into church, if you're having a crappy day, you can say, I'm having a crappy day. And you know what we'll do? We'll pray for you. Well, I, I, y'all got all quiet on me. Y'all can laugh a little bit. Hey, I, I've had those days. You know what I'm talking about. Look, it's okay to come to church and be who you are instead of pretending. You know, put, I put my happy face on. No, just be real here. And that's what it's all about. And so, uh, you know, our heartbeat is to do one thing, to let, lift up Jesus in Marshall County and to let people know uh, who he really is. Amen? And uh, through my message today, I pray you'll, you'll get a glimpse of who he is. Today, we're going to be finishing up a series. We're kicking off a brand new series next week called 50 Days That Changed the World. And we're going to talk about the 50 days between Jesus' resurrection and the uh, day of Pentecost. And that's going to be a great series, so I encourage you to be a part of that. But, but today, we're finishing off a series that we've been doing called Spitting Image. And spitting image has all been where we've been taking names of God in the Old Testament and then finding the, the New Testament fulfillment. And today I'm going to give you a name that's kind of, it, it may be out of the norm, maybe one that you haven't heard before, but it actually comes from uh, Genesis chapter 14. But, but it's the name El Elyon or Jehovah Elyon, which means the Lord Most High. And you go, I hadn't heard that. I hadn't read that. It's in there. It's, it's the Hebrew when, when uh, actually Melchizedek actually is talking to Abraham and he calls the Lord the Lord Most High or God Most High. And so today we're going to talk about who the Lord is. You see that word comes, Elyon, actually originates from the Hebrew root which signifies to go up or to ascend. It means he's the highest of the highest. I don't know about you, but if I'm going to live for a God, I want to know he is the top. He is the only one. He is above all. You know, uh, I was doing some missions work years ago in Thailand, and I was actually, uh, we, were, we were witnessing to some young people, and uh, we were in a city called Patia, and if, if there's anything that I would call a modern Sodom and Gomorrah, that's, that's where this place was. In fact, we would only go during the daytime because the nighttime was so, it was like being on Bourbon Street during Mardi Gras. Uh, I'm telling you, it was, it was st- tough. But we were out there ministering, and, and in that country, they have, they're really focused on the spiritual realm. In fact, most, most uh, of the Thai people have a little spirit house in the, uh, on, the, on their piece of property, and, and they go out and make sacrifices to it because they're scared of the demonic or the other you know, gods that can get them. And so I'm telling this kid about Jesus. And when I told him, I said, he's overcome all power in heaven and earth is given unto him. He goes, you mean he's like the top one? I want him. And I don't know about you, but I, if I'm going to live for a God, I want to live for the most high God. I want to live for the one who is the undisputed world champion God. Come on, somebody. In fact, the psalmist uh, kind of sums it up in Psalms 97, 9. He says, for you, O Lord, are the most high over all the earth, and you are exalted far above all gods, little g, gods. Anything and everything that can pretend to be a god, the Lord is higher than that god. You know, if, if you're thinking about this, li- listen, this this whole verse encapsulates the essence of Jehovah Elyon. His absolute sovereignty, his unparalleled supremacy, 
And, and you know, when we think about a God who is the most high, there's some things that come to my mind. You know, I want to know that he rules and reigns, that he's in charge of things. And God does. I want to know that his influence is beyond conceivable boundaries. See, God operates not in the scene, just the seen realm, but the unseen realm. He operates in the natural and the supernatural. Aren't you glad you got a God that's that big? We used to sing in, in kids' church, my God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. You know why? Because that's how great our God is. He is a great and mighty God. He is, and, and guy. Guys, you got to recognize this. God's supremacy is unquestionable. His power is unfathomable and, and unmatchable. And so when we think of this, it really is all encapsulated in a person. If you want to see who Father God is, you look at one person, and his name is Jesus. Jesus is the embodiment of the Lord Most High. Jesus is the embodiment of the Lord Most High. In fact, if, if, if that's, that's the whole thing. If you want to see who Father God is, look at Jesus. Because he says, when you've seen me, the Son, you've seen the Father. When you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. Now, a lot of people have misconceptions of who God is. They think God is this mean God sitting up in heaven with a big hammer just waiting for you to get out of line. How many of you grew up with that kind of impression of God? I know I did. It's like, just, just get out of line. I'm going to pounce you. Just get, I'm going to get you. Right? Because you say, Pastor, I heard so much about that fire and brimstone and, and, and judgment and all that. And guess what? God's going to judge this world. But I want you to know that Jesus came to give us a picture of God's heart so that you don't misunderstand who God is. God is the most high God. And, and, and we see this invisible God manifested in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the perfect reflection or the spitting image. In fact, when the angel came to proclaim this to Mary in, in Luke 1.32, he even says this. He says, and Jesus, he, Jesus, will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Jesus demonstrates the great links that Jehovah El Yon will go to save his people. What did Jesus do? Jesus laid down his Godship. Okay, he was still God. But what he does is he puts on human flesh and he comes to live with us. I don't know about you, but I'm glad my God came to live and understand who I am. He came to live with us. He did that and he lived, he gave us a model uh, to follow. His lifestyle is a model to follow and he lived a perfect life and became the perfect sacrifice, even giving his life as death on the cross. Jesus really shows us the most high God who is supreme and yet he's sacrificial. That he was willing to die for you and me. He's omnipotent, all-powerful, and yet he has so much compassion and love for us. See, we can miss who God really is because we look at one part of God and we miss the other facets of who he is. I want you to see today that the Most High God loves you so much that he has done everything that needs to be done so you and I can come into a relationship with him. Now we're going to look at a passage in Philippians chapter 2 and we're going to look at 6 through 11 today. And so uh, let me introduce this part where it says, and speaking of Jesus, it says, who being in the very nature God, it didn't say the nature of God, it says the very nature God, he, he is God, did not consider equality with God something to be to be used to his own advantage. In other words, when Jesus came, he laid aside his God powers on the side and said, I'm not going to use that to my advantage. I'm going to come as a human being. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Now, what I want you to get, and this is how awesome God is, he is 100% God, Jesus is 100% God, and he is 100% man. 
but because he wanted to be like you and I, he put aside those powers, those God powers, because see, a lot of people look and they read the New Testament and go, well, Jesus did miracles. Well, if Jesus did miracles because he was God and not because he was a man that was anointed by God and had the Spirit of God flowing through him like you and I can do it, he would not be the exact example. His miracles testify that he is a man used by God, filled of the Spirit. So guess what? When, when we say pray for people, guess what? God's no respecter of person. If he used Jesus, he'll use you. Through his miracles, through his life, when, when he came and he laid that down, what he did is he lived a perfect life. He is the last Adam. He's the last Adam. You say, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, the di only difference between Jesus and us is when he was born, he had no sin nature. He, didn't already, he wasn't already contaminated by sin. He was like the first Adam. But when he lived his life, he lived a perfect life. He did not fall into temptation. But he understands everything you and I go through. I want you to get this because it, this is a revelation of who Jesus is, that he loves you so much. He put on flesh, came down, lived just like you and me, and went through the same thing. He understands us. He gets us. Why? Because look at this in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we possess. In other words, look, we've got somebody that's there for us, that's the intermediator, that's standing in the gap for us. That's Jesus, our high priest. It goes on to say this in verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just, like, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Guys, that's how awesome and how, why he is the most high God because he lived a sinless life but yet he understands everything you're going through you think Jesus understands what it means to be stabbed in the back I mean he's been stabbed in the back by somebody somebody talked bad about you Jesus understands, except it came with a kiss Judas' kiss you think Jesus understands being misunderstood and talked about the Pharisees never got off his case do you think Jesus understood what it was to be hungry? Do you think Jesus understood what it was to, to go through tough times? Do you, under, do you think Jesus understood what it was to have a, a, a tax bill? He did. That's what he, he actually had to tell Peter. Go fishing him. We'll get that coin. Go ahead and pay them taxes. You know what? Jesus understands what you're going through. That is what makes him the most high God because he put aside his God powers to live just like you and I. And the life, when we look at Jesus' life in the scriptures, it is the perfect example of what we can be in him. I'm not saying that we're God. I'm saying that God can live through us a beautiful life that testifies of who he is. That's who God is. Because, guys, when Jesus came with that sinless life, he came to, to, to make a way for us. How many of you caught the Ten Commandments last night? Anybody catch the Ten Commandments? Charlton Heston walking down from the mountain. You know, you know what I'm saying. Come on. But the, the reason they play the Ten Commandments is because it, it speaks to the Passover. You see, Moses came to, to get the children of Israel who were in slavery. And he said, let my people go. Right? Come on, you remember the story. Let my people go. And he comes, and Pharaoh goes, mm -mm, no, not going to do it. Not going to do it. So plague after plague after plague. And then the final one comes, and, and Moses gives this warning. If you don't let them go, the destroyer is going to come, and he's going to kill the firstborn of every household, both men and of animals. But he told the Israelites, he said, you want to do something? Here's what you're going to do. You're going to go, and you're going to sacrifice a perfect lamb. And you're going to take the blood and you're going to put it on the top of the doorpost. And you're going to put it on the sides. And you know what that makes a, that makes a, a cross, doesn't it? You see, you put it on there and what's going to happen is when the enemy comes, he's going to pass over you even though you should have had 
the firstborn taken of your household, he's going to pass over you because of the blood. That's why we were singing about the blood this morning. I plead the blood of Jesus because it, it covers me. His sinless life made a way for me to overcome my biggest problem and your biggest problem. Our biggest problem is what? Sin. I mean, all you got to do is turn on the TV, pull out your phone, probably getting a notice right now. Oh, boop, this happened. Oh, that happened. It doesn't take a moment. You, and this, look, this problem is not a financial problem. It's not an emotional problem. It's not a socioeconomic problem. It is a sin problem. Now, if there was a way that we could take care of our sins, it'd be great. But we have no way to take care of our sins. But because of what Jesus did, because of him coming and giving his, his life, he dealt with sin once and for all. Amen? Come on, somebody. I'm telling you. And, and so I want you to, to, to realize this, that he is the Passover lamb. John saw him coming one day, and he said this in John 1, He says, the next day John looked and saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Jesus came as the Passover lamb to deal with sin. So I want to talk to you for just a moment of the, Jesus' conquest over sin. Jesus' conquest over sin. The very first thing he dealt with, he dealt with the reach of sin. Jesus dealt with the reach of sin. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. Sin is not your neighbor's problem. It's not the, the, the problem of the political party you dislike's problem. It is all of our problem. Got quiet in this house. Mm. No, really. It's all of our problem. It's, it's, it's like a story I heard. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, one of the well-renowned preachers, uh, he was... He, he, he told this story of a, a missionary that went to visit one of his guys in the bush and, and, and he goes to his hut and, it's, and, and he sits down and he's waiting to talk to this guy and it's just filthy, it's all dirt and everything. And, and he, he kinda, he, the missionary looks at the guy and goes, why don't you clean this up? Why don't you go get some soap and water and like clean the floor? And he goes, sir, my floor is like pressed down clay. If I put water on it, it's just going to make mud. And if I put more water on it, it's just going to be worse and worse and worse. And you know what? That's just like us. When we try to take care of our sin, when we're trying to deal with our sin, it just gets worse and worse and worse. How many has been there, done that, got a T-shirt? You know what I'm saying. But, but here's the beautiful thing. That man didn't need to clean his floor. What he needed is he needed a new floor. And with us, the same is true. God, we don't need God just to clean our heart. We need a new heart. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. You need a new heart. And if you don't have a new heart, guess what? That old heart has got sin in it, and it's going to be hard to deal with. It, it's like, I just can't seem to shake this. You know why? Because you haven't been released from the reach of sin. But let me talk about this, that Jesus' death and his sacrifice gave us a new heart. Here's the second thing, the results of sin. There's a result to sin. The wages of sin is death. That's the paycheck for sin. That's what we get. But you see, God, God said this in Genesis. He said, I'm going to judge sin. In Ezekiel, it actually says, the soul that sinneth shall die. But God had set up in the Old Testament a covering for sin. A layaway program, if I can say it that way. How many of you remember layaway? Few of us do. TG and Y. How many remember that? TG and Y. I don't. Very few people know what I'm talking about. I'm 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 definitely aging myself, right? But it's a layaway program. You see, in the Old Testament, they would take an animal, and an animal would be given as a sacrifice to cover, just to cover our sins. And what they did is they had to take a perfect sacrifice one without blemish one that was perfect and they would sacrifice that that lamb and what they would do is the blood would be used to cover the sins but it was a death for the death that they deserved look at what Jesus did Jesus loved you enough that he took all of your sins upon him he became that perfect sacrifice without blemish and because he took that upon himself and he 
allowed, I mean, he submitted to God's plan to, to, for him to be that perfect sacrifice. He purchased and paid for your death. So you don't have to die twice, you only die once. Let me say that again. You don't have to die twice, you only die once. You go, what do you mean, pastor? Well, there's one physical death, but there's a spiritual death after that because you can deal with your own sin. Here's the way you deal with your own sin. You can go at the end of your life, you're going to die, natural death. But then you're going to stand before the judgment. If you don't have anything to plead when you get before the judge, you're going to be sentenced to that second death. But you see, the wonderful thing is, if the if Lord tarries and I, I, he, he brings me home one day, guess what? When I stand before the judgment, I'm going to plead the blood. I plead the blood of Jesus. Uh, Jesus' blood covers me. He cleanses me. You go, well, you didn't do anything for it. Exactly. You can't do anything. Your best effort to God is stinky rags. That's why we got to lean into what Jesus did, the result of sin, and giving our life to him. He's the one that paid that debt. And here's the last one. He's the remedy for sin. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus is the remedy for sin. I mean, no one else could do this. It's clearly stated again and again throughout the Bible. No doctrine in, in Christian faith is clearer than the one that states that Jesus died, rose from the dead to deliver us from sin. And this is what it says in Colossians 2.14. It says, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. In other words, guess what? Because we've sinned, we've racked up a, a, a lot of debt, sin debt. Anybody, anybody got, a, got a sin debt? Yeah. If, you, if you're born, you have a sin debt. You know what? The wonderful thing is, mine's paid in full. The wonderful thing is, mine's paid in full. Not because of anything I could pay. It's like having a million dollar debt and you come to God and you, you, your righteousness is like offering him a penny. Like, I want to pay my debt. Uh-uh. You don't even come close. But you know what? Because of what Jesus did, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. He nailed it to the cross. He, he crucified it. He put it on the cross. He paid it. In fact, when he was hanging there, when he was hanging there, the Lamb of God, the perfect sinless Lamb of God was there and there was no other payment for sin than his life. And when he was hanging there, the devil thought he had won a victory. But when Jesus started to say, it is finished, you know, the Greek there, it's a, those are legal terms. Paid in full. It is finished means paid in full or sentence served completely. It is finished. And when he said that, all of hell began to shake. And he went down to hell. Did you realize that Jesus went down to hell? And what he did is he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave away from Satan. The, the, the very authority that the first Adam laid down, Jesus picked up for you. He picked up. And, he, and on the third day, as he's coming out of that tomb, he steps on the chest of, of, of death. And he, he says, Though I was dead, I am alive forevermore. Amen? I'm telling you, that's what Jesus did for you. And what he was doing through all of that is he was trying to show you the heart, to unveil the heart of the Lord Most High to you. He was trying to show you that heart of boundless love. And mercy for all humanity. That's the reason it says in Philippians 2 8, it says, And being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Jesus obeyed God's will and desire and plan to save us, even though in the natural he didn't feel like it. You say, Pastor, I thought Jesus really wanted to go. Jesus was man, he was man, he had laid down his God powers. And he's man. And you see it when he goes to the garden. He knew what he was about to face. And yet, 
he went away and he, he prayed this prayer in the garden. He said, Father, if there's any other way that this cup can pass from me, let it be done. But not my will, but your will be done. He didn't pray that just once. He prayed that three times. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to look forward to being beaten with a cat of nine tails. I wouldn't want to look forward to having a crown of thorns pressed down on my head. I wouldn't look forward to, to my, my hands and my feet being nailed to a cross. I, I'm sorry, I wouldn't look forward to that. And I don't think Jesus looked forward to it either, but this is what he did. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross for you and me. He endured the cross because he loves you, and that's the heartbeat of God, that God would go to that length to have a relationship with you. To have a relationship with you. So I want you to, I want you to know this. Here's the second part. I, I need to go quickly. God's given us, Jesus, not only did he provide a way through sin, he's given us victory over Satan through death, through the cross. Through the cross. He's given us victory. The great enemy of our soul is sin, but the one who perpetrates it and, and comes along is the tempter, Satan himself. And guess what? God didn't leave us just from giving us forgiveness of our sin, but guess what? He wants you to overcome. He wants you to overcome. He doesn't want you to constantly be tripped up because back in the garden, Eve got tripped up, didn't she? Eve got tripped up in the garden. But you know what? We're not going to get tripped up because now we have victory in the cross. Look at this. And, and, and here's the, these two things I want you to know. Number one, Satan has been disarmed. Colossians 2.15, having disarmed principalities and power, he made a spe public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. What is he talking about, triumphing over them? He's triumphing over them in the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid for your sins, he gave his blood, but he also gave you victory over the enemy. He disarmed him. I mean, do you get that truth? That, the, that I'm not saying that the enemy can't come and try to tempt us anymore, but you don't have to give in to temptation. It was like the story I heard about a guy who was, who was uh, at the zoo and he was watching this zookeeper and he went into the thing, uh, into the cage with the lion and he, he walks right up to him and he's like dropping, you know, just a couple feet away, he's dropping like, you know, meat and he's like, he's like freaking out because it's like, oh my gosh, this dude's going to get eaten. Hopefully he eats the meat and not this guy. And then when he comes out, he goes, why, what, why were you in there that close? I mean, don't you know you could get killed? He goes, I ain't got to worry about that line. He's been toothless for a long time. Ain't nothing he can do to me. Listen, that's exactly what Jesus has done for you. The enemy has been defeated. He is toothless. He doesn't have power. I'm not saying he can't tempt you. But the scripture even tells us when we see him on the day of judgment, we're going to go, is that the guy that's been bothering us all this time? Is this the one? We're going to go, seriously? That guy? That's what I want you to understand, that you have victory. Jesus took the cross and beat the devil silly with it. I mean, he overcame. Come on, somebody. That ought to, if I don't light your fire, your wood's wet. I'm telling you. And so when Jesus, he, he has won that victory, he, I want you to know this, that Satan is also, he's not just disarmed, but he is defeated. I have a little tear apart devil and I take the arms off disarmed and then I pull the feet off and defeat. Okay, you'll get it in a minute. So, he made a public spectacle of Satan. Do you realize that goes back to the way the Romans would do when they had overcome a, a, a country or something, they would take all the, the leaders of the, the, the uh, losing army and they'd put them on a cart and they would parade them through the whole town. And everybody goes, <laughs> loser, loser. You know, that's exactly what Jesus did. He made a public spectacle of Satan on the cross. That's why the cross is so powerful, guys. That's why we are so blessed that the Lord took this, I mean, he, without sin, gave his life. He gave it and took our place. And the very pinnacle of victory, what he did is he rose from the dead. He took away the power of death away from the devil, and Satan is defeated. That's why he's the Lord most high. But he also didn't just do it so he could win the victory. He gave you the power to overcome. 
In fact, it promises that his people in the end times, in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11, it says, And they triumphed over him, talking about Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. In other words, they weren't worried about things. You know why? Because they knew their God had them. So they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. I'm glad I got victory over in the enemy. Amen? You have victory over the enemy if you know the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, I mean, I hate to say it, but you're like, you're like lion food. The enemy will come after you. That's why he says the enemy is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You know, those of us that know Christ, and I'm not trying to put you in an odd place, but if you don't know Christ, you are lion bait. That's who you are. He's looking who he can devour. But God has given you the victory. Now, the final piece of this is, and let me bring it to a close, is Jesus is the doorway to new life. Jesus is the doorway. He's given us victory over sin. He's won. We have, the, uh, we have victory over Satan, and now we have a doorway to new life. You know, a lot of people look at the cross, and they think the cross is a dead end. I mean, the, excuse me, the tomb is the dead end. But it's not a dead end. It, this is not an entrance door for us. This is an exit door for us. It's not an entrance door for us. It's an exit door. God has made a way where there was no way. Look at this from Hebrews 10, verses 19 and 20. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have this confidence to enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus. In other words, we can come into the presence of God now by the blood of Jesus. And he opened by a new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. In other words, by Jesus' death on the cross, he made a way for us to have new life. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. If you're going to have, if you've got to follow his way. He is the way to real life, eternal life. He is the truth. You have to believe it. And, and he will give you that life that we're all desiring. It's, it's through his death and sacrifice of his body he made a way for us to come into relationship with God because that is real eternal life. My, one of my favorite scriptures, John 17, 3. Now this is eternal life. You want to know what eternal life is? Here's the answer. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus said this. Now, this is eternal life. You want to know what eternal life is? It's getting to know Jesus. It's getting to know God the Father. Because when you know them, you have real life. So many people think eternal life is what we do when we close our eyes in this life and, and wake them up in the next. Guess what? Eternal life doesn't start then. It starts right here and now when you know Jesus. That's where eternal life, listen, there, some people go around and go, well, this is just the best it can get. No, you know what? I get a little bit of heaven here on earth. You know why? Because when I have a, this beautiful, sweet relationship with Jesus, it doesn't mean that God takes me out of all my struggles and my problems, but I tell you this, he takes me through it. He goes with me through it. He's with me every step of the way. I don't have to go alone. I've got somebody that helps me. He wants to give us that kind of life, and that's that Zoe life. I'm, I, I want you to understand that it all comes through what Jesus did for us. And that resurrection declares that new life that we have. In fact, in Romans 6, 4, it says, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. Now, let me say this. If you had not been baptized, we're baptizing in a couple weeks. Because, see, what it, this verse says is, what an, is an illustration of what we do in baptism. We're, we die with him. We're buried with him. We're raised to new life in him. That's what baptism, it's an outward expression of the inward change. And what is the inward change? Is that we were ba baptized, we were buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead... Through the glory of the Father, we may too have new life. That's the new life. New life is a relationship with God. It's a relationship with Jesus. And he doesn't want you to live in death. See, a lot of people are dead spiritually. They're still in the tomb. 
It's hard to live in newness of life when you're still living in the tomb, when you're still living under the curse of sin, when you're dealing with all of that. But I know this, that if you will turn to him and you'll surrender your life to him and you'll give your life to him, here's what will happen. The God of all creation will come and he will come and abide in you. I don't, does that blow your mind that the God, the Lord most high, loves you so much that he went to all this length. He's not this God in heaven waiting to pounce on us and kill us and destroy us. No, you have a God who loves you so much that he sacrificed his own life on a cross so he could just have a relationship with you. That's the Lord most high. That's how great he is. And that's why when And let me finish with Philippians 2, and this is my last scripture. It says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under earth. That means those that have already gone on, that are saved, those that are are sinners, are, are here on earth, saved and unsaved, and those under the earth, that means Satan and his crew. Guess what? Everybody one day is going to do this. They're going to bow their knee in heaven and and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We're all going to bow our knee to him. Here's the decision that we have to make. Are we willing to surrender our life to him? Because there is no other name. There's no other name under heaven by which a person can be saved. No other name. So will you surrender to him today? Let me explain that because I want you to get this. Surrendering is that you're willing to let him be in charge. I know a lot of people preach what, what sometimes we would call cheap grace. Oh, just come pray a prayer and you're saved. Guess what? Bad answer. God's not into a transactional relationship with you. You pray a prayer, I'll give you your fire insurance policy. That's not what God's about. Really and truthfully, if you want to boil down a real relationship with Jesus, it's not, it, it's, it's not about praying that one prayer and that being all of it. No, it's, it's like being married to Jesus. Because when you're married to Jesus, guess what? He's going to come home with you. He's going to come home with you. It's a 24-7, 365 kind of relationship. You say, Pastor, you, you say I, I, I can't pray that prayer and be okay? I'm saying if you, you know, it, I, can, I can get married and I can stay away from my house, but it usually doesn't work that well. You know what I'm saying? I can be married and run around and do all kinds of ungodly things, but it probably wouldn't go so well. You know what I'm saying? My wife told me a long time ago, she said, I am not one of these stand by you man kind of women. I will kill you. I'm like, I, I, you know, the fear of God and the fear of my wife right there. Why? Because she ain't going to put up with it. Well, guess what? Why would you expect the jealous God who lives in heaven, who is the Lord most high, to be okay with you just praying a prayer and going your own, own way? No, he wants a relationship with you. He wants to live in you. He wants to walk with you every day. But you got to surrender. Some of you are already saved, but there's areas of your life that you haven't surrendered. God wants you to surrender. Some of you have never surrendered your life at all. You've been, you've, you've been trying to be what, like I say all the time around here, the stupidest Christian bumper sticker that's ever come out is God is my co-pilot. Guess what? If God ain't in the driver's seat, he ain't in the car. Are you willing to let him be the Lord, not loser, the Lord of your life? Are you willing to let him be in charge and lead you and direct you? And are you willing to follow him? Because guys, that's how much he loved you. He laid down his life so you could know him. So let me close with this. If you're willing to receive him, and receive is more than accept. It's more than just saying in my head, oh, I, I received Jesus. It's where you accept him in your heart and say, I want to have a relationship with you, a, a 24-7 relationship with you. 
You can do that today and surrender your life to him.